Parasha Naso. Parasha Naso begins in Numbers chapter 4, verse 21. And spoke Yehu to Moshe, saying, Take et a census of the sons of Gershon, even them by house, their fathers, by their families, from old thirty years and above, even to old men fifty years, you shall number them all who enter to perform the service to do the work of the tabernacle of meeting. The name Naso comes from verse 22, the first word, Naso et Rosh Benei Gershom, take et census of the sons of Gershon. And this is a name that the parasha was given. As always, we will read from the most literal scriptures that we can find. And as we read, we modify to the most literal manner if there's an error in translation as we have been seeing and we hope and we pray and we believe that in reading a literal translation is already a revelation so as we read we are being fed of the stream of the Ruach the Spirit because the Lord said that his words are spirit and we read the scriptures allowing the Spirit to flow in these words so we begin with a prayer giving the honor and glory to Yeshua Blessed are you, Yeshua. Thank you for the book of Numbers and because we continue to advance in this knowing of your wonderful Torah. We give you thanks, Yeshua, for you are faithful to your covenants and because you are with your children and your people. In this moment, we invite you that you would come as our teacher, that you would cover us with blessings as Psalm 84 says that the master, the teacher, will cover us with blessings. And we invite you because of this, our teacher, so that you would cover us with blessings as we are reading the portion, the second one of the book in the desert. Give us a prophetic outlook, prophetic eyes. Give us wisdom. Free us with your truth. Give us discernment. We invite you that you would come and show us your love in these writings, for you are love, and we know that these writings are love. We open our hearts to you, and we bring down every fortress and every wall and every stronghold and every lock that we might have placed in our hearts, and we open the door to our heart that you might enter, Yeshua, and that the love that we feel for you would flow back to you with nothing in the way, so that the love that you have for us would also flow over us that today would be a day when you bless us with your love and that we get to know about your love and we have your heart to love and place in us much love for your truth for you said that you are waiting for us to love truth because we know that you are truth and if we love you because you are truth then we will love any truth that comes from you because you are that wonderful truth Yeshua that this meeting this gathering would be washed over with your love. It would be a multiplication of your love. It would be a deliverance from rancor and grudges and hate. And then we might be able to enter into the bonds of the covenant, the bonds of this covenant of love that you have made with us, with all of humanity, with the children of Israel, with the house of Israel and Judah, with everyone who calls upon your name. Thank you because you are an Elohim of covenant and you keep the covenant. We want to enter into the most deep bonds of the covenant those in which love that flows from you will be seen in our lives. We ask you that you liberate us from all doubt, from all fear, from all lack of faith, and that we might be able today, just like children, come close to your throne and to your feet so that we can hear what you have to say. We praise you and we bless you and we love you so much for hearing this prayer. Be welcome into this place. Baruch haba Yeshua Moreno to this place. Hallelujah. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. All the exaltation is for him. You know, as I was saying in Hebrew, I was saying to the Lord, welcome to this place. I remember that it's important to mention this. Did you notice how to say our teacher in Hebrew? It is said, Morenu. Many times I have shared with brethren about the last names of Jewish last names. They were converted to Catholicism or were like the Murano Jews that kept some of the commandments of the Lord and other traditions as they were in hiding many of these families who are really spread out all over Latin America 
and they hide in Hebrew meaning. And sometimes they will have a different type of word that don't doesn't seem to have anything with the Hebrew. For example, um, very pagan last names. These were some of the things that they did when the Catholics during the times of the Inquisition would force families to convert to their religion. And those who did not sadly were murdered. Therefore, our professor or our teacher is said in Hebrew, Morenu. And from there, the word or the last name, surname Moreno, derives. Our professor Moreno have and other last names have a Hebrew significance or Hebrew meaning. So in Numbers chapter 4 verse 21, the Lord orders Moshe to make a census of the sons of Gershon. Do you remember that Gershon was a son of Levi and of this group of sons of Levi, sons of Koat, and the sons of Merari? And what the Lord does, he gives an instruction to each of the groups with a a different function in the tabernacle and this is what the lord relates there has to be a census and i'm not talking about a census of everyone but only of those who are able to serve in the tabernacle and therefore they describe here what is the function of the sons of gershon and i continue to read continuing in verse 24 this the service of the families of the gershonite in serving and in caring and they shall carry it the curtains of the tabernacle and at the tabernacle of meeting its covering and the covering of the badger skins that on it and at the screen of the door of the tabernacle of meeting and at the hangings of the court and at the screen for the door of the gate of the court which around the tabernacle and the altar around and at their cords and all the furnishings of the service and at all that is made for these things so shall they serve therefore the gershonites will take the curtains the door of the tent of meeting and they have specific objects that they have to carry in the kohites in the beginning of chapter four it is described what they do but it is part of the previous portion but elazar the son of aharon he will be in charge of the the oil of lighting and the incense of spices aromatic spices and it's all the charge of the tabernacle and everything that is in it which is a wonderful work and gershon as i said the sons of gershon they have this function verse 29 the sons of merari by their families and by house their fathers you shall number them from old 30 years and above and even to old 50 years you shall number them everyone who enters the service to do at the work of the tabernacle of meeting and this what they must carry as all their servants for the tabernacle of meeting the boards of the tabernacle and its bars and its pillars and its sockets and the pillars to the court around and with their sockets pegs and cords with all their furnishings and all their service and by name you shall assign it the items he must carry thus the sons of merari are in charge of the cords and of the boards of the tabernacle look how beautiful this order that the lord gives to each one of the different groups of Levites and each with their own assignment to take and carry and assemble when the children of Israel have to march to take certain utensils through certain groups each person with their work with their assignment with their gifting for the gifting of the Levites it's to be able to do this so if the Levite is not disposed for example if he's impure He's not able to come close to take the Ark of the Covenant or any of the holy utensils. This is a type of heart that the Lord is awaiting from us. When the Lord comes with his glory, with his kavod, and he visits us, then we must think of that the greater the presence of the Lord and his glory, so is the judgment. If there is impurity, uncleanliness, disobedience, if a person's not prepared, they might die in the glory of the Lord. One brother was giving this example. The priest leaves his family who has to minister on a certain day or he's in charge for a certain day to take the Ark of the Covenant or part of the covenant. And he says his goodbyes to his families, not knowing if he will return in case that he is impure. Therefore, it might be that he might die in the service. Therefore, it seems like a terrible thing, beloved brethren, to the cold eyes of our mind. But look, let's look 
look with the eyes of the heart. The presence of Elohim, the Almighty, Eloe Israel, is with us. Imagine for a moment that it is like so. And I have to go and I have to be, go close to where the same self-presence of the Lord is, where his whole presence is manifested. It is fearful, but he is very loving because it is more fearful of the Lord that you can imagine. And he is more loving than you can imagine. And we are his children. What does a child do when he sees his father? He runs to his arms. Therefore, think about this, brethren. If you are able to go and come close to the presence of the Lord, is something that we all desire. It's something that we all want to do. So do not allow your mind to play tricks on you that you can think that coming close to the presence of the Lord is dangerous for that's not the point the Lord is wonderful and we claim and we call out for his presence to come today and that his glory would come and we say once and again it's true but when the glory comes we must be pure we are going to be pure we seek the spiritual purity therefore we expel all demons and we use Use the water to be pure in the powerful name of Yeshua, placing the sacrifice of Yeshua in the water. And therefore, we're able to go to the presence of the glory of the Lord in spirit spiritual purity so that we will might not die while well, the presence of the Lord is manifested. The word danger has no place in this situation, nor does the word fear. It has no place. I'm not sure if you've had an opportunity to be in a place where the presence of the Lord was moving powerfully and gloriously. And I'll tell you one thing, I want to be there. I feel the presence of the Lord and I want to be where it manifests. We must love Yeshua and his presence and seek it it with everything, even if it costs us our life. When that moment arrives, we want to say, I don't care if I die. If I have to die, so be it. But I will die in the glory of the Lord. Therefore, you brother, you sister, are able to discover that you have been liberated from all fear. For fear is a lie. It is not truth. There is nothing to fear in the glory of the Lord. But in order for us to honor him, we are going to purify ourselves because this is what he ordered us. Because we love him, we do what he asks us to do, which is to purify ourselves and be free of all impurity, of all uncleanliness. Can you feel what he waits from us? He wants us to run to him with the heart of a child, obedient, respecting his commandments, for he is the Almighty, the Elohe Israel, the one that reaches the heavens and has come close to us and has come close to the children of Israel, is the heavens touching the earth. And this can be done only if it's done in his order. The heavens touch the earth, and Moshe hears the voice of the Lord from the mercy seat, from over the Ark of the Covenant, for the order of Elohim was established so that this might come to pass. And Moshe was not fearful when he would go to speak to him. There it is no fear in this place. Remember that Elohim is the same, and the same Elohim is the one that wants to come be close to us. And therefore, when we begin to keep his commandments, we are sending him an invitation to visit us with his glory because the conditions are being created which are necessary for heaven to touch the earth for the kingdom of heaven has come close. Let us think of each of us who has a different gifting, a different message, and let us take the object, even if it's so small, from the tabernacle, speaking in spiritual sense, and let us go forward where the Lord says to move and where the Lord sends us to be in an encampment. We place it in its place. Praise be his name. So now we go to chapter 5. And spoke Yehud to Moshe, saying, Command at the sons of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper and every one who has a discharge and whoever becomes defiled by a corpse from male to female you shall put out toward outside the camp and you shall put them the not that they may defile at their camps of which I dwell in the midst and did so the sons of Israel and put them toward outside the camp as spoke Yehu to Moshe so did the sons of Israel let us remember that the tabernacle is 
and spiritual image of many things, and among those things is of our life, our homes, our bodies. The encampment of the children of Israel, the Lord declares, must be pure, and everyone who's impure must be removed. It's like if our house has a patio or a garden, and it must be pure, and then inside the house it must also be pure, and inside our house would be like the court of the tabernacle, and we ourselves are the temple of the Lord. We would be like the tent of meeting of the tabernacle, and our heart would be like the holy, the holiest place. And the Lord says, all of this must be pure. And what does he refer to? To the spiritual purity. That is the definition of pure and impure is in the Torah. And things that are impure are described in the Torah in all type of uncleanliness of all types. The Lord says that you have to set apart everything that is impure, that has had a flow, women, men who had touched something dead. Here they do properly translate it as impurity of soul. At the end of verse 2, it says if he touched a dead body, the people must go out of the encampment. And it is not forever, unless it's the case of leprosy. But the person will go out of the encampment, and they will go through a purification process, and when they are pure, they come back in. And in fact, in the encampment of the children of Israel, there was a special place for those who had arrived impure. For example, the children of Israel had to go to war. When they came back, they could not enter into the encampment. They had to remain outside and go through waters of purification, which later on you will see in the book of Numbers, described as it is prepared by a sacrifice. And and therefore, they would remain outside and they had to be washed with water, await for seven days, wash the first day, the third day, and the seventh day. And when they were pure, they're able to enter into the encampment. What is the Lord doing? Well, what he is doing, he's instructing to leave all unclean spirit, all demons outside of the encampment. The unclean things are a place where an unclean spirit can land. And the unclean spirits, they are allowed to be in unclean things. If there are no unclean things, then the demons have a difficult time to land or to get to visit their home. Very simple. Therefore, the Lord says that all have to be pure so that you will not die when you enter into the tabernacle. And as I was saying, an unclean spirit cannot be close to the glory of the Lord. The Lord destroys him and by default will also destroy the person on whom the demon was. Therefore, it is very clear and very simple. You simply have to understand that the Torah speaks of impurity, the same one that Yeshua speaks. Therefore, when Yeshua expelled a legion from a man and the legion asked to go to the pigs, the Lord allows them to go to the pigs simply because pigs are unclean animals. They're not considered as food. The Torah allows the unclean spirits to go into the pigs. The Lord doesn't have a problem allowing the unclean spirits to go to the pigs. If the legion had, for example, asked to go to cows, the answer of the Lord would have been completely different. And therefore, what the Lord is teaching us is that our home, the place where we dwell, must be pure. Now, pay attention that the instructions of the Torah say, the Torah says that we must be pure and keep our encampment pure. Therefore, if the encampment is contaminated, we must purify. It. Like I was saying, the Lord was saying, don't touch, don't touch. Did you touch? Then purify yourself. And in this manner, with the knowledge and understanding of what things are pure and which things are impure, we're going to seek that our homes would be a pure encampment, a pure tabernacle that Yeshua might be able to dwell in us and that his presence might be manifested so that it may be pleasing to the Lord. The Lord does not like abominations. An abomination, for example, is to place something impure in the holy place. Therefore, let us remember we are the temples. If the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh is in you, then you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the tent of meeting, and you cannot do any abominations and place impurity inside the tabernacle. Thank you, Yeshua, for your Torah. Blessed is the name of Yeshua. Numbers 5.5. 5. Here you are able to see the manifested love of Yeshua. Here, the love of Yeshua is manifested. 
And spoke Yehu to Moshe, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, a man or woman, when commits any sin that man commit in unfaithfulness against Yehu and is guilty person that he shall confess et the sin which he has committed and he shall make restitution for et his traspa in full and fifth of it plus to it and give to the one he has wronged to him but if no the man has a relative to whom the restitution the wrong for the wrong the restitution to Yehu for the priest in addition to the ram of the atonement with which atonement is made for him and every offering of all the holy things of the sons of Israel, which they bring to the priest, this shall be. Therefore the sacrifice here is manifested when a person sins. He must confess, as verse 7 says, and they will confess at their sins. It says two things, and they will confess, Aleph, Tav, Yeshua, and they will confess the sins. It's like a beautiful game, a game of words, with the Aleph, Tav, and without the Aleph Dav. It is saying two things at the same time. Therefore, through the sacrifice was received forgiveness. Hallelujah, Yeshua. Yeshua said he came to fulfill the Torah and the sacrifice that was made, the Eyal, the Ram for the atonement of which speaks verse 8, was fulfilled by Yeshua. Thank you, Lord. But if we must have restitution, we must restitute with a fifth, 20% more. Thank you, Yeshua, for fulfilling the sacrifice for forgiveness. Numbers 5 is... 11. The law concerning jealousy. We can call this part of the portion within the portion. Nasso. The Lord speaks of the spirit of jealousy, and it's not something bad. It refers to when a man is jealous, when the Lord allows a spirit of jealousy to come over this man. There is no other section that is similar concerning the woman having jealousy over the man, for the Lord has to find it like so only the man. This does not mean that the man is better than the woman or that the woman is worse than the man or anything like that. This is just how it was defined by the Elohim. And if the Lord has defined it like so, it must be good. We will commence in verse 11. And spoke Yehu to Moshe saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, Man, man, if goes astray wife and commits against him a trespass and lies a man with her lying sewing and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband and it is concealed that she has defiled herself and witness no against her and she nor was caught and if comes upon him the spirit of jealousy and he becomes jealous at of his wife and she has defied herself or comes upon him the spirit of jealousy and he becomes jealous of at his wife and although not has defiled herself it's speaking of a man when a woman commits adultery and the lord allows this spirit of jealousy to come over him. Ruach kina is how the spirit of jealousy is said. And pay attention, brethren, that the same self Elohim defines himself as jealous. The same word, kiniti et sion, I am jealous over Zion. The Lord himself defines himself as a jealous Elohim. And therefore the Lord allows also that the man be jealous. In actuality, that the man be jealous, this spirit that the Lord would send to this man of whom the woman was unfaithful, it would be revealing to the man where there are no witnesses in the case that it came to pass. But the Spirit can also come without any reason. Therefore, the Lord is here giving the procedure in case of this spirit comes upon him. In verse 15, And then shall bring the man at his wife to the priest, and he shall bring at the offering required for her a tenth of the ephah of meal, barley. No, he shall pour on it oil, and no put on it frankincense, because a grain offering of jealousy, it a offering of remembering for bringing to remembrance iniquity or guilt. And shall bring her near the priest and set her before Yehu, and shall take the priest water holy, Mayim Kedoshim, says in Hebrew, in a vessel earthen, and some of the dust that on the floor of the tabernacle shall take the priest and put into the water, and shall stand the priest at the woman before Yehu, and uncover at head of the woman, and put in her hands at the offering for remembering the grain offering of jealousy that, and in his hand, the priest shall have 
have water, the bitter, that brings a curse, and shall put under oath her, the priest, and say to the woman, If no has lain man with you, and if not, you have gone astray to impurity under your husbands, be free from water bitter that brings curses these. But you, if have gone astray under your husbands, and if you have defiled yourself and has lain with you some man other than your husband, then shall put priest at the woman under the curse of the oath. And shall say the priest to the woman, Make Yehu you an oath and curse among your people when makes Yehu at your thigh to rot and at your belly to swell. And may go water that causes curses these, the bitter ones, into the stomach and make swell belly and rot thigh and shall say the woman, Amen, Amen. And shall write at oaths these the priest in a book and he shall scrape off into water the bitter and drink he shall make at the woman at water the bitter that brings a curse and shall enter her the water that brings the curse bitter and shall take the priest from the hand of the woman at the vegetable offering of jealousy and shall wave at the offering before Yehu and bring it to the altar and shall take a handful of the priest of the offering at and its memorial and burn on the altar and afterward drink at make the woman at the water and when he has made her to drink at the water and it shall be if she has defiled herself and behaved unfaithfully toward her husband that will enter her the water that the brings a curse bitter and will swell her belly and will rot her thigh and will become woman and oath among her people. But if not has defiled herself the woman and clean is, then she shall be free and may conceive children. This the law of jealousy when goes astray a wife under her husband and defiles herself or man when comes upon a man the spirit of jealousy and he becomes jealous of at his wife, then he shall stand at the woman before Yehu and he shall execute upon her the priest at all all the law, this, the Torah, and shall be free the man from iniquity, from guilt, but woman that shall bear it her guilt. In verse 22, it is the first time that the word Amen appears. And this word, also known as Amen, in Hebrew it is pronounced Amen. And in the book of Psalms, we're able to see it many times where the word Amen is in pronunciation, where it appears. We might not be in accord with what we have learned socially with a Christian mentality or religious mentality concerning marriage and the order established by Yeshua concerning marriage. And this is very sad because we have removed ourselves so much from the definition that Elohim himself has placed in scripture about the concept of marriage, which looks nothing like today's concept of marriage, of what was from the beginning and in the past. Many can categorize this as old and ancient and that humanism and modern society and democracy and when things are spoken of um, equality and social rights between men and women, that is something good. But the result has not been good, sadly. The example that is most pressing concerning what is good or of the blessing of keeping the marriage concerning the way it was described in the Torah and concerning family is what happens within Jewish societies in meaning in the Jewish religion, and it is true. Jewish religion maintains and keeps many laws that many are not in accordance with what the scripture and the Torah says. But let's think carefully about marriage. Marriage, according to the scriptures, is not easy to be broken and divide. We have read much of the words of Yeshua, many of us since we were children, where Yeshua has a discussion with the religious Jews and says, how is it that Moshe allowed us to have a letter of divorce and Yeshua responds because of the hardness of your heart according to the Torah according to the Torah beloved brethren and remember this what I am saying so that you might understand the concept of marriage according to Elohim himself established according to the Torah the woman cannot divorce the man the man cannot divorce his wife if the wife is faithful there is a possibility of divorcing the wife when the man finds something indecent after they were married this is something that happens during the 
the first days, maybe the first day, you are able to annul the marriage according to the laws of Elohim for whatever reason as they are able to define it or translate as indecent. We can think of many things, but if the woman is faithful, the man cannot divorce her after a year or not of two or three years. In the case that the woman and the man have united and they had lain together before being married, the man can never divorce that wife. He cannot divorce her. The Torah defines things very differently than the way we have known from the laws of men. And what is most important is the direction of the Ruach HaKodesh. It is the will of Yeshua. Marriages within believers have to be arranged, planned, and approved by Yeshua because we are servants of Yeshua. Remember, when someone is a servant, that person does not decide who their wife is, but the Lord decides who is going to be his wife. He is the one that gives his servant his wife and a woman who is a servant also. It is the master, the Lord, who decides and we are servants. We have confessed him as our Lord, our master, that he is Yeshua. And if you have, therefore, it is Yeshua decides who will be your wife. He's the one that's going to give you your wife. And we know that Yeshua and our communion, our relationship with Yeshua, our communication with Yeshua is supernatural. He speaks to us in supernatural manner and we hear and understand his voice in a supernatural way that people with logic and the unbelievers do not understand. We might see the newspaper, we might see a phrase and we understand that the Lord himself is the one speaking because we have confessed him as our master, our teacher, our prophet, our pastor, our shepherd. We recognize his voice and this is supernatural. The unbelievers don't understand it, don't accept it, but we are able to discern it. They cannot discern it. And there are many other ways and manners where the Lord can speak to you. And in the case of a union of two children of the Most High, it must be the Lord who manifests what is his will and not we manifesting our will to him so that he might do it for us. We said that he might do his will in our lives and not our mind, not my own. We cannot just take any wife and a woman can not take just any man. It must be the one that the Lord has prepared. And in this manner, a marriage can be established in the order of Elohim and in the love of Elohim, which is the most important. When the Lord plans a couple, he establishes them in his love. And Elohim is eternal. It is not the love of man. And it is time for the children of the Most High, especially the young ones, would understand that there is an unclean spirit spirit that's called the spirit of love and they would expel it because it is destroying our society. The spirit of love is destroying our society. It comes to destroy, it enters into some people, it remains a few years, but then it leaves. But the love of Elohim remains forever. It is something completely different from what we have learned from television and society and as we have seen also the order within a union must be the order of Elohim as the Torah says and we are reading. This is how the Lord established it. So the example I wanted to give you concerning society and those who keep um, and practice the Jewish religion. In these places, it is established a lot closer to what Elohim defines as marriage unions. And the result is a very low number of divorces. Also, in the Christian religion, the amount of divorces is equal to or even more than society. This should give us something to think about, to meditate. We have always known and believed that a family must be united in spirit and in truth for how powerful and wonderful it is to have a family united in spirit and in truth. And there are few who are able to enjoy this even to this day. But the Lord has given us all the tools and the most powerful weapon and tool is the Torah. Because if we obey the Torah, the Lord saves and unites our family in spirit and in truth. But if we don't do it, then it is the mercies of the Lord that can keep the family united. But we have seen the results. Look throughout Christianity if there's unity in the family, if they're in the same spirit. 
the young people, with the elders, the responses and the answers make me suffer. But this is why I want to manifest to all that the Lord from the beginning gave us all the tools and instructions so that our home might be really a place where the Lord rests, the beloved tabernacle where his presence rests, where he rests. And therefore, let us follow and keep the Torah for the commandments of the Lord are his word. The word is light and it is more powerful than darkness. And the Lord says to repeat the commandments that are in the Torah to our children in the morning and in the evening. Let's begin to do it and let us see a change that has not been seen for centuries. Chapter 6, the vow of the Nazarites. And spoke Yahweh to Moshe saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, a man or woman when either consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to Yehu from wine and drink, he shall separate himself vinegar made from wine, nor vinegar made from drink, neither he shall drink in any juice, grape, neither shall he drink in grapes fresh or raisins, nor eat. All the days of his separation or Nazarite, all that is produced by the grapevine from the seed and to the skin, nothing he shall eat. All the days of the vow of his separation, Nazarite, razor no shall come upon his head until are fulfilled the days for which he separated himself to Yehu, holy he shall be. He shall let grow the locks of the hair of his head. All the days that he separates himself to Yehu, a body dead, not he shall go near, even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister, not he shall make himself impure when they die because his separation to Elohim on his head. All the days of his separation or Nazarite shall be holy he to Yehu. This is what is called the Nazarite vow. It is a dedication that is made to the Lord. A person dedicates a man or a woman to the Lord and the Lord gives the instruction of how how to do this Nazarite vow and how it is also finalized. Let us pay attention that in order to finalize the vow of the Nazarite, there is also necessary to have the service of the temple. For the Nazarite will be a sin to him that when he begins a vow and completely dedicates himself to eat the product of the grape or fermented drinks or wine. So to shave his head would become a sin or to touch a, a corpse, a dead body would also become a sin. And therefore the Nazarite vow today is impossible to fulfill in the case that, for example, a person would touch a dead body during his vow would be a sin and the person would have to offer a sacrifice in the temple. Let us look at verse 9 concerning this. And if dies anyone beside him very suddenly and he defiles head, his consecrated, then he shall shave his head on the day of the cleansing. On the day seventh, he shall shave it. And on the day eighth, he shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall offer the priest one as a sin offering and one as a burnt offering and make atonement for him because he sinned in regard to the corpse in the soul, says, and he shall sanctify at his head day that. Therefore, if perchance he was in contact with a dead body or in the house or the home of, of someone who has died, therefore he has to bring the turtle doves and shave his head completely and it would be a sin for him. Therefore, if he also takes some cider, the Nazarite vow is fulfilled with the service of the temple. Let us remember that neder is a vow and it is mentioned many a time in the Torah and it is similar to to the marriage vow. Though the Torah does not specify concerning marriage, as many have said, there is no marriage ceremony or the blessings of the marriage. The Torah speaks of many unions, and many of these unions were with the supernatural hand of the Lord. For example, Yitzhak and Rebekah, the son of Abraham, is a story where you can see the hand of the Lord. Abraham and his wife, we can see the hand of the Lord in those unions. Continue in verse 13. And this, the Torah of the Nazarite, when are fulfilled the days of his separation. It is understood that when the Nazarite, when he would begin this time of being set apart for the Lord, he ahead of time would establish how long his time of separation would be. He shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and he shall present at his offering to Yehu male lamb in first its year, without blemish, one as a burnt offering, 
and a new lamb in one first its year without blemish as a sin offering, and a ram one without blemish as peace offering, and a basket of unleavened bread, fine flour, cakes of mixed with oil, and wafers unleavened anointed with oil, and the vegetable offering, and with their drink offerings, and shall bring the priest before Yehu, and offer at his offering, and at his burnt offering, and at the ram he shall offer as a sacrifice, as of peace offering to Yehu, with the basket of unleavened bread, and he shall offer the priest at its vegetable offering, and at its drink offering, and shall shave the Nazarite, the door of the tabernacle of meaning at head his consecrated, and he shall take at the hair from the head his consecrated, and put on the fire with which under the sacrifice of the peace offering, and he shall take the priest at the shoulder boiled of the ram and cake unleavened one from the basket and wafer unleavened one and put upon the hands of the Nazarite after he has shaved at his consecrated hair and shall wave them the priest as a wave offering before Yehu holy are for the priest together with the priest of the wave offering and the thigh of the heave offering and after that may drink the Nazarite wine this the law of the Nazarite who vows the offering to to Yehu for his separation, and besides that, whatever else is able to provide his hand according to the vow which he takes, so he must do according to the law of his separation or Nazarite. This vow of the Nazarite was also kept by some of the first believers, as it is related in the Acts of the Apostles. And we can conclude that the first followers of Yeshua, the first believers, kept the commandments of the Lord and respected the temple and also went to the temple to finalize their vows. Hallelujah. Yeshua did not come to annul or abolish the Torah or the prophets. The reason why he did not come into more details concerning this because by centuries it has given, given too much importance to the lives of the first believers and of the first disciples and to study their behavior of these believers has taken the place that should be taking the study of the words of Yeshua. And therefore we're going to follow the Lamb wherever he might go. And we're going to concentrate on what he says and what his Torah says and the prophets and the Psalms and the work of the followers of Yeshua, we're not going to spend so much time in that and we're not going to exalt any other man here. The Nazarite vow shows us that the Lord establishes that there is a manner to more intimately dedicate yourself to the Lord. This is what we could call a retreat. Having this difficulty that in order to do this, the temple service is required because you need it to shave your hair and burn the hair in the fire of the altar. Therefore, what we can learn from this is that we are able to, and it is possible to dedicate ourselves for some time to the Lord. But it is more important that he place in the Torah itself that speaks of a dedication to him, intimate and complete, but not perpetual. And we are able to meditate on what is the spiritual significance and spiritual implications of wine and grapes. I am not saying that the produce and the products of the wine and the vine is bad or evil. Simply that for this dedication of the Lord, the Lord says not to have any products of the grapes, including the skins or anything like the raisins. What seems to be is there's a spiritual channel that is closed when there is a contact with the grapes. There is true that there is a great blessing connected to the vine and the grapes, which are a blessing. But we're talking about a time of being set apart for the Lord, as the Lord himself commands us to fast. And we know that he is good. And we understand that fasting is good. And we know it is a great blessing to eat. But to fast is good. It is also a blessing of which we keep ourselves from something that is good. It is strange. Logic does not understand it. Therefore, the case of wine and the products of grapes has a spiritual implication that we do not know. Therefore, brethren, we're able to do any type of sacrifice as fasting or keeping from certain foods. But if in us there is not a humble heart, then our sacrifice means nothing. Let us pay attention. What the Lord wants is a contrite, humble heart. This is what pleases him. Therefore, all of these things come together. They go together. I fast, I sacrifice, I am humble, I submit. Verse 22. 
And spoke Yahu to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aharon and to his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless et the sons of Israel. Say to them, Look how wonderful this begins. The Lord is saying here, This is how you are going to bless the sons of Israel. And he says specifically to Aharon and his sons, The blessing that comes soon must be great, for the Lord himself is ordering how to do it. This is a vision where the Lord Yeshua says how you are to bless the sons of Israel. And we're going to read it with this heart. Bless you, Yehu, and keep you. Shine, Yehu, make his face upon you and be gracious to you. Lift up, Yehu, his countenance upon you and give you shalom. And they shall put at my name on the sons of Israel and I will bless them. Oh, how beautiful this is, brethren. We must remember this. This instruction is given to the sons of Aaron, those who are instructed to bless with this blessing. Do you remember what Zechariah 14 verse 9 says? And Yehu shall be king over all the earth. In that day, Yehu shall be one and his name one. Therefore, this blessing has to be done in the name of Yeshua. Look how full of love is the heart of Elohim that within his Torah, of all the instructions, he also gives the instruction of how the children of Israel must be blessed. And you should not feel a stranger. The Lord has placed us all as children of Israel because of Yeshua and through Yeshua, the Messiah. And I think this is a good moment where I can bless my brethren who are hearing this message right now. In the name of Yeshua, I will use the name of Yeshua and in in the Hebrew language, I will bless you wherever you are, beloved brethren. And I give Yeshua and ask Yeshua to give me all the unction in order to do it and that he might place his spirit in the words that are going to be pronounced as a blessing over you, brethren, in the powerful name of Yeshua, according to the blessings of the covenant. I will do it in Hebrew. <laughs> ביחונקה, אשא ישוע פניו אליך, ויעשם לך שלום. ושמתי את שם ישוע המשיח עליך, בשם ישוע המשיח. אמן. Pay attention that verse 27 says, So shall they put at my name on the sons b'nai Israel, and I will bless them. And they will place it, and they will place Yeshua, my name. And therefore, I place the name of Yeshua over you, son of Israel, over you, daughter of Israel, in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah. And says Elohim, and I will bless him. The blessings come from Yeshua. Hallelujah. Blessed is his name. And thank you for the blessing that we have received today. Chapter 7. And it came to pass when had finished Moshe setting up at the tabernacle that he anointed it and consecrated it and at all the furnishings and at the altar and at all the utensils. So he anointed them and consecrated them. Pay attention. The oil and all the utensils, they were anointed in oil. In this oil that would have been unique that the Lord orders the children of Israel to prepare for the tabernacle. The oil is very important, essential. Do you remember when Yeshua sent out his disciples, the 70, that they would anoint the sick with oil and they would be healed? And therefore, the oil for our tabernacle, for our home, to anoint our home with oil and write the name of the Lord with oil and to anoint the things that we have with oil is something that the Lord instructs to do the sons of Israel in the tabernacle. If we are the encampment and the tabernacle of the Lord today, then the oil should not be stranger to us. It is a blessing. And I especially speak about the oil of anointing. For the oil here in Israel was made of olives. And if you have not placed the oil of anointing as part of your life, if you have not included as being a part of being a disciple of Yeshua, you may now begin, uh, you can buy some and be able to get some olive oil. And if there is none in your country, then find another oil. Use it specifically for blessing, for blessing your things, your sons, for blessing the objects, and anoint the objects and proclaim them pure after purifying them with water and the sacrifice of Yeshua. Use it for when you pray for the sick. Place some oil in your hand and use it. Use the oil. 
the Lord instructed his disciples to anoint the sick and heal. And all of this is to be done in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah. Let me tell you about a dream that I had some time ago, about one or two weeks back, concerning the anointing oil. In this dream, I was outside of Israel in this um, land where I am. There was a hospital and there was a person in the hospital who was a believer and had just died. And I was thinking, well, I need to go to the hospital and order to this person's spirit to return. And I w entered into the hospital and there was this person who was a dark color like Africa, but the person was standing and almost outside of themselves and he was going mad. They were trying to calm him down and they placed him in a bed and I got close in order to pray for him. And in that moment, I remember that I had oil of anointing in my pocket. And therefore, I took my hand, placed it in my pocket in order to retrieve the oil. And what happened is I had a hard time finding the anointing oil that was in my pocket. And I was able to perceive that there was demonic presence that was not allowing me to find and take out the anointing oil from my pocket, but I was able to conquer this presence and retrieve the anointing oil. But then I remembered the oil was not completely pure for I had used it in order to anoint certain things and I had found some dust inside of it, very little. But either way, I thought I cannot use it again. So I'm going to go and proclaim and the person was already in bed and the person had calmed down in their bed and I could see that on their head there was a wound, an open wound. They had not been close. It wasn't very big, but it was an open wound and it was practically dying. And I proclaimed healing and with this little vessel, I took some anointing oil and placed it over his head and I put it to the side so that the oil, which had had some dust, would not fall on the wound and it might have perfume and it might irritate the wound. And beloved brethren, you know that at the moment that I was placing the oil, an explosion of light, very quiet, took the whole place and the entire place was filled with that light as if lightning had fallen in the place. And everything was filled with light in that moment. And in that moment, the person who was dying begins to praise the Lord and give him thanks. And it is manifested that he felt very well after he had suffered so much, especially after a person has been suffering a lot and all of a sudden that pain is removed and he begins to give thanks. That is how the person was behaving. And that oil completely changed the place and brought healing and deliverance. And in a dream which was dark, as I use the anointing oil, it reverted and changed the entire situation and liberated healing and the will of the Lord. What I am saying is do not forget the anointing oil. It is important and it is a blessing. Take oil and bless your home and put and place oil on the doorways, at the entrance of your rooms, at the entrance of your home, on the windows, and anoint your home with oil so that the presence of the Lord might dwell. But before you place the anointing oil, make a purification of your home with water. Use the water by placing the sacrifice of Yeshua into the water and sprinkle the water all around even seven times, just as the Torah says, so that the house might be pure of all contamination. Also use the water over your beds and the pillows of your home, anywhere where there can be impurity and proclaim it to be pure. The Lord has given us tools, the wonderful sacrifice of Yeshua, the wonderful name of Yeshua, the powerful blood of Yeshua, and also the water in order to purify ourselves. Let us use all these tools in order to battle and have the victory that Yeshua gave us on the, the execution stake. Blessed be the name of Yeshua. We're not going to read the entirety of number seven, but we'll read the beginning. And it came to pass when had finished Moshe setting up Et to the tabernacle, and he anointed it, it consecrated it, and Et all the furnishings, and Et the altar, and Et all the utensils. So he anointed them and consecrated them. And an offering made the leaders of Israel, the heads of the houses, the fathers, they, the leaders of the tribes, they who stood over those who were numbered, 
and they brought at their offering before Yehu six carts covered and two ten oxen, a cart for two of the leaders and an ox for one, and they presented them before the tabernacle. And spoke Yehu to Moshe, saying, Accept from them that they may be used in doing at the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and you shall give them to the Levites every man according to his service. So took Moshe at the carts and at the oxen and gave them to the Levites. At two carts and at four oxen he gave them to the sons of Gershon according to their service. And at four carts and at eight oxen he gave to the sons of Merari according to their service under the authority of Itamar son of Aaron the priest. But to the sons of Kohath none he gave because the service of the holy things theirs on their shoulders they carried and offered the leaders at the dedication the altar when it was anointed. So offered the leaders at their offering before the altar. For said Yehu to Moshe, leader one for the day, leader one for the day, they shall offer at their offering for the dedication of the altar. And now commands all the tribes of Israel during 12 days to bring an offering over the altar. We're going to read only the first one. And you can tell me who is going to be the first tribe that will present themselves? Yehuda. Yes, Yehuda is the first tribe. Reading from verse 12, the presentation of the tribe of Yehuda. And the one who offered on the day first at his offering Nason, Naashon, son of Abinadab from the tribe of Yehuda, and his offering platter silver, one thirty and a hundred the weight of that and bowl of one silver seventy shekels according to the shekel of the sanctuary the two of them full of fine flour mixed with oil as a vegetable offering pan of one ten gold full of incense bull one son young ram one of the male lamb in one first its year a burnt offering kid of the goats one as a sin offering for the sacrifice of the peace offerings oxen two rams five male goats five and male lambs in the first of their year five this the offering of nashon son of abinadab and verse 18 be begins with the tribe of Issachar, and all these tribes present themselves before the lord with the offerings during 12 consecutive days and the altar is dedicated after being anointed order of elohim is established in the encampment and reading from verse 89 and went moshe into the tabernacle of meeting to speak with him and he heard at the voice of the one speaking to him from above the mercy seat that on the ark of the testimony from between two the cherubim thus he spoke to him do you see this beloved brethren what is spoken and when entered moshe to the tent of meeting to speak to him then heard it and he heard at yeshua the voice speaking to him and heard the word yeshua the word speaking to him from over the mercy seat on that the ark of the testimony from between the two children thus he spoke to him and we know that we are the tabernacle of the lord and he speaks to us and his voice is heard over the ark of the covenant that is within us because he lives within us and we must make that this tabernacle where dwells the elohim of israel the elohe israel be pure so that he might dwell the lord in it and that the lord himself yeshua might be able to enter into the holiest of holies and speak to us in that place of our being where we hear the voice of the lord praise be his name and here we finish the portion and the message of this portion and we give the kavod to yeshua yeshua we give you all the glory it is wonderful your torah and we read Rejoice in learning your paths and your ancient ways as the Lord says in Jeremiah. Ask, stand by the streets and ask concerning the ancient paths where the good path is passing through. And we thank you for teaching us the ancient paths. Increase the love and the desire of all the brethren and of their families, Lord, and all of them to the 
uttermost parts of the earth, the corners of the earth, that are called in this hour to love the ancient paths and to push themselves and require and inquire, where do these ancient paths go? Yeshua, we give you thanks for all of this and we ask you for the unction of your oil, that your oil would descend upon us, your unction, your anointed would descend upon us of everyone who is listening to these messages and those who embrace your commandments and your covenant and practice purification and are asking more of you and want to be prepared to receive your kavod. Fill us with your oil and with your unction and with your anointing as they are walking and they are going into the bonds of your covenant and keeping your commandments, Yeshua. That this would be expanded and be a tremendous move of your ruach and not adhering and, and seeing it as a tremendous movement of man according to the concept of man, but that the ancient paths would be revived and that which was rejected by centuries today we're able to see in that cornerstone. This is tremendous because you are tremendous, because you are your Torah. You are the Word and because the truth is making us free. It's setting us free. We bless you. We praise you. And just as we are praying in this moment, we're calling upon your name. We are also ask you for the Shalom of Yerushalayim that you would bring the shalom, that you would bring justice, you would bring salvation over Jerusalem as your word says, and we ask that a calling, a call would be raised throughout all the earth to the uttermost parts of the earth, calling out for your mercy so that that torch would be lit on fire and that word would be fulfilled that all the nations would come to call upon the name of the Lord of Israel here because the the prophecy says that the mount of the house of the Lord will be established as the head of the mountains and the nations shall run to it. And therefore, Yeshua, that a spirit would arise in your spirit of your disciples, of those who love you, Yeshua, and make intercession for Yerushalayim. And we say shalom over Yerushalayim, shalom over Israel, shalom over the remnant of Israel, over all the nations. Come, Yeshua, soon. Come, Yeshua. Yeshua soon. To you be the glory and the honor. And we pray this in the powerful name of Yeshua the Messiah, your name. Amen. Shalom al-Israel. Peace be over Israel, brethren.